Today is August 8th, 2011, and we are in the Global State College Robert F. Kidd Library Archives office interviewing Mr. Samuel Weech about his military service. Could you please give me um, your full name as, as it is recorded on your birth certificate? My name is Samuel Kenton Leach Jr. Okay. Do you have a nickname, sir? Kent. All right. Or Sam. I go by either one. Okay. Um, um, what would you have been known as in the military? By what? Um, Leach. Leach. Okay. <laughs> I, I know last names are, are big. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, where were you born and raised, sir? Actually, I was born in Taylorville, Illinois. Uh, my father was a geologist who, um, when he went to school in the GI Bill after World War II, uh -huh. he, was, he was in the Army Air Corps. He was in the China Burma India Theater. And um, after several years of working construction out of the military, he decided to go to college and he got a degree in geology, which put him in a place where he was working for gas wells and oil wells. Mm -hmm. So he started in West Virginia, but the company he worked for took him to um, Illinois for two years, and that's just happened to be where I was born. Uh -huh. And then, of course, I grew up up until age eight or nine in Dunbar, uh, Canal Valley, or Chemical Valley, or whatever you want to call it uh -huh. those days. Um, he, my father passed away uh, a week before my fifth birthday. And being that my brother and I were born 11 and a half months apart, we were the same age. Mm -hmm. You know, we're same age 17 days out of every year. We were the same age. We were both four years old when my father died. Mm -hmm. And my mother was six months pregnant with my little sister. And she had just lost her mother seven months before that. Mm -hmm. So um, we used to vacation in Pocahontas County um, as a, we, young people. My father was an outdoorsman. Mm -hmm. He used to love to hunt and fish and, you know, all the, you know, ginseng and, you know, ramps. And uh -huh. So um, when my father died, it wasn't but a few years, my mother asked us if we wanted to move to Pocahontas County. Well, of course, we always had good memories of it. That's you know, that's where we went on vacations. So we moved to uh, Back Mountain. Um, uh, Back Mountain Road is between Cass and Durban on the uh, back side of Allegheny Mountain. Uh -huh. um, and then we moved to the town of Cass. And that's when my mother started teaching school. And I was in Cass up and through eighth grade. And then uh, my mother built a house in uh, Green, where we're building a house in Green Bank. Mm -hmm. And the um, house and fire caught, house and cast caught fire the day we actually moved. Mm -hmm. And so not everything was moved out of the house and caught fire and burned a lot of stuff up. But um, then we moved to Green Bank, and that's where I was till I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, wh what was your father's connection to West Virginia? Uh, he was born and bred in West Virginia. Um, he was. His side of the family is from uh, Monroe and Summers County. Mm -hmm. He actually was raised in Alderson, but his um, parents were actually raised uh, in Mon uh, Monroe County. Mm -hmm. His grandfather was um, Chap um, John Gwen Stevens. His, his mother's father was John Gwen Stevens. He was an artillery sergeant in, in Chapman's Battery in the um, Civil War, mm -hmm. and that was right out of Union. And then uh, his father, Addison Leach, uh, was from Gap Mills. Or his grandfather uh, was from Gap Mills. And he was a um, uh, sharpshooter in the 27th Virginia Infantry in Stonewall Jackson's Brigade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that um, if your father wouldn't have passed away, do you think you would have ended up living in West Virginia any anyways? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was no leave. We, we may have ended up living in Pocahontas County anyway. Uh-huh. You know, because that he was very fond of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother's family had parents had gotten that farm on Back Mountain in the 20s and were able to hold on to it because uh, she was a TB nurse, traveled mm -hmm. through Canal, Mason, you know, that area, Mason mm -hmm. counties and all that. So um, even the gas rationing in World War II didn't have an effect on her because, you know, she traveled for her job, and her job was important. Mm -hmm. So, and she made, you know, she was making money. So they were able to keep the farm through the depression and everything. I see. And uh, when, he, of course, then my mother and father started dating, they would come to Pocahontas County, and he just, he was bold over and loved it. And, mm -hmm. So they met in West Virginia too. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, actually, uh, they don't remember it. My mother doesn't remember it, but when, uh, when they were married, 
one of her relatives said, well, you knew him when you were five years old. Mm -hmm. and tried to place the location, but she couldn't remember, you know, they were just kids then. Mm -hmm. So they actually had interaction from the time they were five or six all the way. Okay. All right. And um, you, you were saying that uh, you were, the, the memories you do have of your father um, in, in coming to West Virginia, you were, um, you know, you'd mentioned ginsenging and, mm -hmm. and different things like that. I mean, is that something that you carried on interest in? I did until I was injured in the military, and uh, it's to my knees, and uh -huh. it's become progressive. I have uh, osteoarthritis to my knees from an injury I have in the military. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as the years go, I used to ski, I used to hunt, mm -hmm. and I used to fish. Now it's, it's hard. So I can walk uphill, but it's real hard for me to walk down. Mm -hmm. You know, so my handicap is keeping me back. But, yeah, okay. my brother still does. Yes. No, yeah, he's got a hunting cabin on Back Mountain on the same property. Uh-huh. And... Uh, yeah, his, his son's carried on, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. Okay. Um, <coughs> were you drafted into the military? No. Okay. Um, my draft number at the time was, um, I can't remember if it was my junior or senior year, but it was 17. And um, I can't remember if I had just ended the draft or not when I, it was around that time whenever I, when I joined on the little late enlistment option. Okay. Um, can you give a brief explanation as to as to why you entered the military? Um, well, like I said, my draft number was seventeen, so it was pretty obvious I was going to go, and the uh, Vietnam War was on. Mm -hmm. And um, there was nothing in Pocahontas County to do unless you were a logger, worked for the post office, or taught school. Mm -hmm. There's pretty much nothing else you could, you know to do. Mm -hmm. And um, my future wasn't looking so bright, so I um, joined the military, actually joined the Navy with the theory that you don't see submarines in Vietnam, you know, and um, which is, you know, I don't know, I was young and not so smart as I thought I was in those days, but um, um, I knew I could, I could get out and see something, get some experience somewhere. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they were sending the POWs home about this time anyway, you know, so I knew the war was coming to an end, mm -hmm. you know, so I joined the military for six years. Okay. And you said you did, you chose the Navy? Yes. And you mm -hmm. wasn't pushed into that in any way? No. Or? Um, I know my recruiter had a quota, but um, I was, I mean, I did it, what I had to do to get in. Okay. You know. All right. Um, you had mentioned that, that prior to... Uh, how old were you when you entered? Um, I was 17 when I joined. When I entered, I was 18. Okay. And you'd mentioned a few years, you'd mentioned to me previously, a few years earlier, you'd visited Washington, D.C. during the... Uh, the Great Protest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was in the late 60s. Um, did that have any, any sort of impact on you or anything at all? Well, I even had a commune next door. Uh -huh. I remember the veterans getting out and we were going to live off the land and raise hogs and... All this, you know, these farms, family, you know, hippies and yes. all that would get together. Well, there, I even have one next door to my house. Uh -huh. And they were quite disappointed when they found out I was going to join the military. Uh -huh. But um, I, it was a calling I had to do, you know, okay. because, like I said, um, there wasn't much for me. And, um, you know, this is, they have snowshoe now and things like this and, and the Cassini Guerrero and all. Well, back then, you know, was, there wasn't mm -hmm. much to look forward to, you know. Mm -hmm. Were you saying, you know, some of these hippies that you're describing down there, mm -hmm. were they previously, you know, veterans? Uh, some of them were, Some yeah. of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, um, had been to Vietnam, and um, I don't know, they had that, boy, there was a big protest attitude in America back then. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wanted to protest this and protest that and protest the war, and of course, now they, they're talking, it wasn't really a just war, but, you know, um, there were a lot of people against it. I mean, it got it grew and grew and grew until people were protesting everything back in those days. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, some of them were veterans, and for, of course they had a different idea. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go get a job and grow into corporate America and all mm -hmm. this. You know, that they were going to raise hogs, and they found that life was a little tougher than they expected. You know, uh -huh. and uh, of course you don't see them nowadays. Yes, yes. Was that something very popular? I mean, was there a lot of these communes around West in Virginia? In my area, it was because this is so far back in the boonies. Uh -huh. You know, uh, the area of Lobelia in Pocahontas County had several communes in there. 
and uh, Back Mountain, I think there was one. Allegheny Mountain, I remember one. Mm -hmm. My next door, you know, from, in Green Bank. Mm -hmm. um, touch on that, I mean, did you, a little bit more, did you have any experiences with those individuals at all? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were my neighbors. You yeah. Know, associated with them. I would help them go over ring hogs' noses or, you know, um, one fellow made uh, stained glass lampshades and stuff. That's what I thought I, how he made his in, what income they had. Mm -hmm. You know, um, was making stained glass lampshades and things like that. And he was teaching me how to do that. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good interaction. All right, and that was previous to your military service. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you have much intera any interaction with them after? You know, had it dissipated somewhat. Or? They had dissipated somewhat by the time I got out. Um, I did see a couple of them for a while, but uh, the guy who made the lampshades was working for the mercantile in Durban. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had gotten a job, uh -huh. and I found out he eventually left here and uh, we got. Well, he had, I don't know if he had a degree or not, but I'm thinking he would. Mm -hmm. Um, one of them turned out to be a state bee inspector. Mm -hmm. um, one of them went to work for sewage treatment somehow, but now has, is living in, uh, and then went to Washington, D.C. and moved into more, I don't know, I think he's an executive somewhere now or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they've dissipated. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you attend your basic training at, sir? Great Lakes, North Chicago, Illinois. Okay. Um, do you, uh, have any experiences or any uh, opinions or anything you'd like to mention about your basic training? Oh my gosh. I lost 60 pounds in boot camp. Uh -huh. um, went from a size 44 britches to a 36. Um, I had a company commander who was a lot more strict than the other company commanders. Okay. He was an African American, he stood about 5 foot 1 and he was very mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't throw rocks at us, you know, when we were doing push-ups and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I mean, I can see where he's coming from now. But, I mean, there was, even in those days, some companies would send their clothes off to the laundry to get done, and, you know. Uh-huh. We didn't have that. We had a little brush and a box of Tide. Uh-huh. You know, and, of course, you know, you have a drying room where you have to tie all the little knots to hang your clothes up just right. Uh-huh. And there are going to be a thousand hits in a drying room on inspection, which, of course, always got you in trouble, and which made things harder. Uh-huh. You know. He was very different. I mean, he was very tough. Um, like I said, he, he had the a one thing called the thinking position. It's where you get down and put a position and you put your hands on your face and stand on your elbows. And he would keep you there until there was a big puddle of sweat on the ground beneath your face. You know, uh -huh. um, yeah, and the other companies didn't have it quite, but the ones I could see, you know, mm -hmm. there could have been some there that did. Uh -huh. But I know ours was tough. Like I said, I lost 60 pounds and, and it was 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was it's kind of luck of the draw. I mean, you got stuck you know, with one of the... Yeah, we were the state flag company for the graduates graduating ceremonies, we were supposed to carry state flags. Uh -huh. We started off with 87 people and there were 43. We had to borrow seven people to to carry the flags with us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what happened to the guys that didn't make it through? I mean, how did... Uh, don't, some of them disappeared off the face of the earth, but some of them uh, were held back and, and uh, Read. yeah, put and recycled to another company or something like that. I see. Yeah. Um, you know, during that strenuous time, was there, I mean, was there times that you thought Man, maybe I made the wrong decision, or there was no time to think anything like that. Uh huh. I mean, it was five thirty was Reveille, and you were in bed by nine thirty, and that was. You know, I mean, there was no, uh, there's no television or radio, or you know, you lucky to get a cigarette. Uh huh. You know? um, um, yeah. I mean, you're lucky to have a chance to get something to eat. Sometime. Uh huh. Just get through it. You, know, you go in there and get your plate, and you just sit down and take your first spoonful when he's coming in there yelling at you. And you're running back to turn your plate in, you know, you're uh -huh. eating as fast as you can off of while you're taking it back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was your first unit after, or uh, first duty after um, basic? Uh, I was in A school. Okay. Uh, I was a fire controlman. It was called FTA school. Uh, it was. Well, the first one was basic electricity, basic electricity and electronics (BEE). Everybody called it beep school. Mm -hmm. um, that's giving your fundamentals in electricity and electronics. And then um, I was a fire went to fire control school, 
that is um, fire controlmen are the ones who maintain and operate the equipment that aim and fire and um, track targets, you know, to where you, you know, take care of the electronics to fire bullets and missiles to hit your target. Mm -hmm. You know, the radars and gyroscopes and computers and all that. Of course, the computer that did that was, oh, bigger than that bookshelf right there. Probably clear over there, mm -hmm. a little bit shorter. Okay, you know. very large. Mm -hmm. Big gyroscope sitting on the floor that turned about 80,000 RPMs to keep the gun, you know, so the gun barrels stay in the same place as the ship's moving around, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the electronics was uh, pretty heavy duty. The classes were really tough mm -hmm. because they didn't want people who were, you know, not very smart to get the job or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They had what they call IBM. If you flunked out of school, you were an instant postman's mate. So that was quite an incentive, you know, if you didn't want to chip and paint the rest of your career that you would finish the school. Uh -huh. uh, the final exam was a trigonometric problem. Um, this is before calculators and stuff, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it was two trigonometry problems. It's if your ship is traveling in this direction and the bow is raised this many degrees and you're listening to port this many degrees and you're traveling this many knots and the wind is blowing this direction so many knots, you have an airplane that's climbing at this rate heading in this direction, and he's going this speed, where do you fire that bullet to hit him four seconds from now? Uh -huh. And it was all paper and pencil. And, that, and there was two problems, and each one took four hours to do. And it was eight hours sitting there working out the math. Uh -huh. And uh, that was the final exam. Okay. How long did that training take? Uh, I think it was 12 weeks. Okay. 12, 14 weeks maybe. Okay. All right. Um, and how did you do? Oh, that did very well, actually. Okay. They had a, you know how to cuss? Yeah, for okay. sure. They had a, uh, another in, uh, incentive there. If you didn't get a, uh, like a C or a B or something or better, uh -huh. then the next week you went to what's called Thumb Fuck. Uh -huh. It was a class. And it was in the evenings for three hours. You had to be there five days a week for three hours uh -huh. studying for last week's test to retake it again while you're going to school this week for the next this week's test. Uh -huh. So uh, that was quite an incentive. I only, I only ended up in Dumb Fuck once. Uh -huh. I think it cause I got a C or something. Yeah. But after that, it was A's and B's just because I didn't want to spend my evening studying for a test I should have passed last week uh -huh. while trying to study for the one to pass this week. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after that, um, where where did you head? USS Gray, DE-1054, San Diego, California. Okay. And what did the uh, duties there? Well, um, I was a fire controlman. Okay. Um, the ship was on its way to, first question was asked me, oh, are you here for the beep of Demas? And I'm like, what? You know, so it must be just out of your school. So, so uh -huh. come to find out, um, working when I was indoctrinated in my division and all everything and finally figured it out, we were going to overhaul and they were putting on what they called a basic point defense surface missile system on the back of the ship. Uh -huh. And my, I was an FTM, which meant missiles. That was going to be where I would be working. So we went to Todd Shipyards in Seattle for about eight months and everything was refitted. I mean, uh, down to the sonar dome, um, we uh, got the basic point defense was installed, the BPDMS, you know, BPDSMS. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, our flight deck was extended wider and longer. You could just so we could land a helicopter instead of them just dropping things off your mail, food, and out at sea or whatever. Mm -hmm. We actually a helicopter hangar was made taller and it, it extended out over top. You know, most of the flight deck. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of things happened in this overhaul. And then uh, it was um, we weren't quite finished, and I don't know what happened. Maybe it was a schedule or something. Pulled into Long Beach and got trimmed up and cleaned up and we went dead in the water in Oregon surrounded by 37 Russian fishing trawlers which were famous for locking fire control radar on us mm -hmm. you know so that um, we were in real good shape pulling along Long Beach got fixed up repainted refit California then it was overseas okay all right um, so where did your deployment take you uh, first stop was uh, Pearl Harbor it was only for a very short time, maybe a day or two. Um, second stop was Midway Islands. That was for refueling. Mm -hmm. um, that was for maybe 12 hours. 
you know, I got to see nothing but goonie birds. I mean, I heard there was nothing but goonie birds on Midway Island. I thought the place was pretty desolate. Well, what it is, Midway Island was just covered with goonie birds, albatross. Mm -hmm. There's even a statue of a goonie bird in the middle of the island. Some sailor had whittled out of wood and it's 12 feet tall. Uh -huh. um, then it was off to the Philippine Islands. And we were stationed in the um, Subic Bay area of the Philippines. Okay. Um, what um, type of actions did uh, did your ship uh, take part in in support of the Vietnam conflict? Um, when I had gotten on board the ship, I was actually the only um, veteran on the ship had not been to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, they were going over actually more frequently uh, during the Vietnam War, and um, there was a. I know that these guys were showing me magazines that showed me all the things that the USS Gray had done in Vietnam. You know, where mm -hmm. they assisted in this and destroyed this and did this. You know, but uh, when I was there, on my cruise was the first peacetime cruise they had, mm -hmm. and actually the closest I got to Vietnam was um, I could see it. Mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't even know what it was. I just know we were at sea, in the South China Sea. And I was on roving patrol because I can neither confirm nor deny the use of nuclear weapons on board the USS Gray, mm -hmm. which Japan wouldn't let us in. So they had a roving patrol carry a 45, you know, 24 hours a day, just wandering the ship and making sure there was nobody foreign on the ship or whatever. And I was roving patrol. Mm -hmm. And I saw this land over, so I didn't know what it was. I went to the bridge to sea. And there was the map, Vietnam, we ran off the coast of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing that was there. But when I was in the Philippines, see now that there was a lot of, this is right after, during and after the evacuation. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of Filipinos on Grand Island, Philippines, um, where they were evacuating. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, I was there for the, the evacuation era, you know, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, the closest I ever got to where I could just see it. You know, it was kind of like, oh, that's Vietnam, you know, that's, I lost my friend here, you know, my friend's father died there, and, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of, but that was, that was never in country, uh -huh. you know, never brown water navy, um, I'm just known as a Vietnam era vet, because mm -hmm. I was in there, in that era. Yes, yes. You know, so. Okay. Um, did you, um, do any work with any foreign nationals? Um. What do you mean, work with? Um, I mean, just, oh well, I mean, went to school with Australians and German sailors, you know, but um, I, we, it, we, our mission at the time, because it was the end of the Vietnam War, was to show the flag, mm -hmm. you know, show a presence. Um, I got to see a lot of the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean area, era, or mm -hmm. area. Uh, I went to, after the Philippines, we went to um, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We went to Pakistan, it was in Karachi, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Now it's probably the most dangerous place in the world for an American to be. Mm -hmm. And then Mombasa, Kenya. And then Port Louis, Mauritius. And then, uh, whew, hard to remember all these places. Australia? Yeah, Perth. And then Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And then Hong Kong. But that's what we did. We were there as more of an ambassador. I mean, even though we were. Once we got to the Indian Ocean, we were a group of we were um, a group of three ships. Um, it wasn't long after entering the Indian Ocean that the Soviet Navy picked us up and followed us around everywhere we went. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, that was I don't know. It was the Cold War, and uh, I guess tensions were high in that area. Uh huh. It was the Middle East and Africa. Yes. And uh, that's what we were told. We were there to. And not only that, like I said, we were carrying something on our ship that, uh -huh. that I can either confirm or deny. Uh huh. You know? I see. Okay. Um, did uh, did you um, d during any down times? I mean, during the going to all these places. I mean, uh, it probably varied, but um, were you guys allowed to go? I mean, go into the the you know foreign soil and? Oh yeah. And party? Yes, or you know, yeah. just anything. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, once in Hong Kong, we couldn't cross over to China, uh -huh. and it was probably not smart to go in certain places of um, Subic City. Uh -huh. You know, uh, in Mauritius, we weren't even allowed to wear uniforms. 
you know, because um, the, uh, I guess, anti-American attitude at the time there or something. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Philippines, I was stationed more than anywhere. And um, there was a town, a city there, called Alongapo City. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. No. No, well, if you ever hear an American sailor talk about Alongapo City in those days, uh -huh. no matter how bizarre the story sounds, believe it. Uh-huh. All right? I mean, I could elaborate, but I'm afraid to. Uh-huh. Um, only place in the world where you get a haircut and a blowjob at the same time. Uh-huh. Um, the Filipinos called Longpo Sin City. Mm -hmm. I happened to get lucky and I met a girl who um, just took me to inter introduce me to her family one time. Uh-huh. And after that, um, I started going on my own out to visit her family and her, you know. And they kind of took me in and I started dating her. And um, she, it was her grandmother, her, her little sister, and her little brother. Mm -hmm. <coughs> she was 21 at the time, I think I was 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. Her grandmother, I have no idea how old she was, but her sister was 16. She was dating a Filipino sailor. And her brother was 13, Mario. He was um, a long post city chess champion. Mm -hmm. And um, that was where I got my most unique experience because um, I quit going downtown where the sailors hung out. Mm -hmm. I quit going to where the Americans hung out. I was going to where the Filipinos went, you know, and uh, Filipino bars and go to church. I went to, you know, the, the priest at her church was an Irish Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. Filipinos are very Catholic, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, I stayed with her family most of the time I was there. And I was there quite some time, and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. You know, mm -hmm. to learn to not have to go run and get a hamburger. You know, eat fish, dried fish and rice, and you know, and some very strange things. Mm -hmm. So the the real lifestyle there, when you experienced that, that was somewhat a good bit different than what the experience was for. Very much different. The majority of, of the Filipinos sailors. are a lot more slower in their actions. They're walking. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid to touch each other. Mm -hmm. uh, put their arm around you, or you or them, or you know how Americans are kind of standoffish about it. Mm -hmm. They're not there. Um, they, when you see a crowd of people, you can always tell the Americans because they're walking fast. Not only are they taller, you know, but they're walking faster and kind of like shoving everybody out of the way. And, um, and of course, I, I could see where they were coming from. You know, I, I could see their attitude about some of the things they thought about Americans and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, they loved Americans on the most part. I mean, they emulated us. We, I remember going to Manila during Holy Week. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I don't know if you've heard of it, but in, in the, the Philippines during Holy Week, these people actually nail themselves to crosses and carry them through the streets. You know, you, you, you know, somebody gets nailed to a cross and they carry you down the street. Mm -hmm. And then the nails come out and somebody else goes on there and nail him on there and carry him down farther. And there's people walking on their knees with rags around their knees. They're just bloody, soaking wet because mm -hmm. they're walking the whole parade on their knees. And they got the thorn crowns and the blood dripping down their face, you know, and mm -hmm. it's something else. But we were in a restaurant and um, it was with a friend of mine, James, and a friend of mine, his nickname is Bird Dog. Uh -huh. Bird Dog and James and I are still friends. Uh -huh. um, we were drinking San Miguel beer in this restaurant. Well, we hadn't been there long and we were eating. Uh, first time we ever tried dog meat, too, was at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. But um, um, we're drinking beer and there's people, you know, standing there watching us. And I can't figure out why there's people standing there staring at us. Mm -hmm. Well, next thing I know, as soon as your beer gets about this much in it, there's another one there. You know, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not here to get drunk, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, we're sitting there eating dog meat. There's one song on the jukebox that's in English. Uh -huh. You know, that was Skyline Pigeon by Elton John. So we played it over and over and over. And we did start getting lit. And, we're, and we're, we learned the words of the song while we were there, clinking our beers. And they said, I know that the whole restaurant's lined up. People standing there watching us. Uh -huh. And I said, you know, what's going on? And the guy told us, he said, um, he said, these people remember you and from World War II. He said, it was Americans that saved us. Uh -huh. He said, the Japanese were slaughtering us like pigs. He said, these Americans came here and saved us. And he said, these people remember that. Uh -huh. So it was really moving, you know, that you think that they're buying your beers, you know. Uh -huh. 
that's why it is. They just want to see you have a good time. They want to take care of you now. Uh-huh. You know? I see. That's interesting. It was interesting. Uh-huh. Um, is there any other experiences that, that, that you'd like to mention? I mean, about your, your just instances, you know, out, out into these, uh, these different countries and things. Oh, I don't know. Um, it was an experience. I'll tell you what gave me a heck of an education. Uh-huh. You know, um, I learned to be more accepting of different cultures and people. Mm-hmm. You know, one, that's bound to happen. I know when it comes to the Asiatic peoples that uh, most Americans can't tell by looking if a Korean from a Japanese, from a Filipino to a Chinese, but I can, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I remember being at sea and being hit by two typhoons at once, you know, stripped the paint rail off one half of the ship. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen a lot of things with my eyes that um, most people probably couldn't fathom, mm-hmm. you know, both uh, disparity and miracle. You know what I mean? I've mm-hmm. seen things that, from traveling so much, that Americans would either be aghast or be um, quite interested in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, with all these different foreign nationals, I mean, that that you've been around, you know, throughout the time. I mean, uh, was there? I mean, a wide range of just different different feelings towards the mil- uh, you know, from the the foreigners to their feelings towards you guys or did you usually receive a, a pretty you know elaborate welcome like you were saying or well it depends on where you were uh-huh. um a, a long ago city had so many sailors coming in there and of course you know the bars were getting busted up and people fighting on i mean this is like the wild west this city mm-hmm. you know prostitutes and and drunkards and you know anything that you can think of illegal is going on in sin city along mm-hmm. the well, you know, of course, they get a little uh, calloused towards Americans in the city, you know, and things get pretty nasty. I mean, there was a dead sailor or marine there every week, mm-hmm. you know. They didn't mind; they'd kill you. So you go from a country like that, or a town like that. Like I say, I graduated away from there by living with this family. Yes, yes. But um, then you go to another country like uh, Pakistan. That's a Muslim country, and I have never seen so much poverty in my life. Mm-hmm. As I have seen there, the first thing I saw was a woman taking water and flour and patting it down on the sidewalk. It was so hot, and it just cooked. She rolled it up, and that was her dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you could take a wall like this, put two by sixes on it, and that's an apartment building. They lived in cubicles, you know, six two by six squares on the side of a building. Um, there's so many flies there, and people, lay, you know, sleeping. I mean, it's, it's crowded 24 hours a day, just solid masses of crowded. The people, uh-huh. and people be sleeping on the sidewalk. You see, a, you know, the, the, the flies aren't even used to being swatted at over there. Yeah, you know, it's, you go like that and get one. I mean, you see people passing the sidewalk, you know, fly crawl on their nose, back out in their mouth, you know, and, mm-hmm. and just I have never seen so much poverty in my life. Uh-huh. You know, it was, it, but you had no problems with anybody trying to kill you. You know, nobody trying to take your money, nobody trying to do you wrong. You know. For mm-hmm. some reason, it was completely different, you know. Whereas the film the, went in the Long Post City, they had, but they wanted more. These people didn't have, and they, they weren't going to, it wasn't theirs, they didn't want it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know, and then you go to Africa and and all these different tribes there, you know, you have the ones that pull their ear, you know, hang stones in their ear so they stretch out they take their ear and pull fold up over top of the rest of their ear you know and you get the ones that put the bumps all over their head and you know uh-huh. and uh when i was in mauritius one guy told me we've been bustling and traveling for several days and doing things and going to see this and going to you know visit that and taking this tour and and finally the last day we were there we just told our cab driver we just want to go someplace where it's quiet mm-hmm. you know we want to just take it easy so he took us to a park that actually overlooked our ship tank, anchored out. Okay. Uh-huh. And um, we weren't allowed to talk about our jobs or anything, you know, like, what do you do? Well, I'm a fire control and I pull the trigger, so it shoots that big gun right there, you know? Mm-hmm. They don't want, I don't want, what do you want to think about telling somebody, you know, what I did? And we're, we're told not to. Yeah. But um, he said, I just want you all to. So I want to thank you. I, well, I wanted to thank him too for you know. I said this is really nice. You know, finally get to settle in. 
He said, well, I want you to be able to go to your country and say that when I was in Mauritius, I had people take care of me. Mm -hmm. The people were good there. Whereas that's, I'd never heard that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know? He just wanted to ensure that he was being an ambassador of his country, too. I see. Yeah. How did, I mean, how was the communication, I mean, between, you know, these, these different places? I mean, was, did you run into a lot of people that spoke English? I mean... It depends. Um, let's see. Philippines, everybody spoke English. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they started learning English from the first grade. They were an American protectorate for a long time. Well, since it was from the Spanish-American War to the end of World War Two. You know, they were an American protectorate, so they spoke English. Um, we gave them their independence on July 4th, same as ours is. Mm -hmm. um, then you go to Pakistan, and of course, the cab drivers that were soliciting you knew English. So they would do a lot of your translating. And I was surprised to find enough, you know, quite a few people did speak English there mm -hmm. and would translate to somebody else. Of course, you're on the streets of Hong Kong and you're trying to find a price on something and you're asking everybody that goes by, do you speak English? Do you speak English? Do you, you know, it's hard to find somebody and finally somebody will stop. Yeah. And you say, how much is this? And they'll tell you, tell her I'll give her this for it, you know. Uh -huh. And they'll send her translate a little bit and on their way. Uh huh. We were getting into a cab and um, had a friend get in a cab in Taiwan. He was heading home for emergency leave mm -hmm. and the guy just didn't speak English. And he was trying to tell him airport. So he was going, of course, he's going, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing all the, whoo, like, you know, take me to the airport kind of thing. But he just ended up getting out and having to find another cab. Uh -huh. And in Africa, almost everybody spoke English. You know, it was amazing. I guess because they were British Commonwealth at one time in Kenya. Uh -huh. Um, what was interesting about Mauritius, in the day when we were importing African Americans as slaves, they were taking in uh, Chinese as slaves. Mm -hmm. So 60% of the country was Mauritian native Indians. Um, you have a lot of uh, people from India and Pakistan, places like that there, but then you have a, a major portion of the population that's Chinese mm -hmm. because it's the descendants of the slaves that came in to work the sugar plantations there. Yeah. Well, the national language of the country is English, so they pretty much all speak English, but everybody speaks French. So it wasn't uncommon to see somebody sitting in an opium den, Chinese smoking opium, speaking French. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because they had a law there that they were making opium illegal. Uh -huh. Remember when the beer law changed here? If you were a certain age, you could drink before that. And, yes. You know, as it went up, well, that's the same thing they did there with opium because uh, it was a, becoming a problem. And but there were people addicted. So if you're before, born before this date, you could do opium. If you're born after this date, you could. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, you mentioned buying things. I mean, how did, uh, I mean, was there much regulation? You know, from the Navy, or was it paid much attention to? I mean, as to you know, regular items, uh, you know, just anything from from fruit to um, you know, cameras to you know, even maybe even drugs, if you want to mm -hmm. delve into that. I mean, okay, I'm sure I'll delve into it. Um, drugs were um, something that was very common in the era I was in, mm -hmm. and was not. I guarantee a major proportion of the ship either smoked marijuana or did drugs. Mm -hmm more people did than didn't in mm -hmm. that era. Um, when you're at sea, overseas, there's a pan on the quarter deck. You roll a one or a three or a six, you're strip searched. Okay? You roll a one, two, four, five, then you're just pass searched. Mm -hmm. And of course if you bring anything on board it's searched over. Um, there are sniffer dogs in the Philippines, you know, because it's a major port for the Navy at the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to leave and go to Pakistan, Africa, you know, these places and come, they keep everything and it's tagged until you can bring the sniffer dog and, cook and go over because the Pakistanis will pack their camel saddles full of hashish mm -hmm. or they even put it in the soles of their shoe for air pillow insoles or up in the northern territories they insulate their houses with hashish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't know if you're getting something. You can buy a set of onyx glasses but the cardboard that the box is made in may be made of hemp. Mm -hmm. So you don't know until the dogs sniff it and get back. Mm -hmm. and so they tag everything. Of course, I'm, I, was, I missed somebody swapped me out something I ever really wanted because they swiped mine and left me something else. So you maybe was kind of careless about making sure they kept a good eye on your stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and um, 
electronics was something, you know, everybody came home with stereos and you know, everybody had a space they could find to put it in that was legal, mm -hmm. you know, bring home stereos and cameras and, you know, it was cheaper over there. <clears throat> um, what was, I mean, what was the punishment if you got caught with something that you weren't supposed to have, whether it be drugs or oh, anything else? Well, they could drum me out for drugs, but um, I know people would, uh, now they can drum you out if you turn dirty on a um, drug test. Yes. They didn't then. Uh-huh. You know, the guy got um, busted for marijuana three times. He was still in the military. Mm -hmm. um, I remember... Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong you go to a pharmacy and um, you didn't need a prescription. You get 300 Valium 10s and they gift wrap them, hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, they had the drug test, you know, last day there, and I think it was like 27 people on the ship that got caught for just uh, Valiums alone or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, the punishment was stiff. I think. Um, there were three guys who got caught with Valiums, they, and how stiff it is now, mm -hmm. you know. But then it was, I think they got 60 days restriction, 45 extra duty, and loss of stripe, mm -hmm. you know. Possession of Valiums is what it was. Mm -hmm. And then um, even an officer got caught with a hashish in his camel saddle, you know. But who's to know, you know, he didn't... Yeah, you it could have been... Yes, yes. You know, um, were you allowed to send things back to family at all? They let, like if you went to bought yeah, some sort of electronics, you could mm -hmm. send it back to you? Yeah, sure. I see. Yeah. Well, you didn't get mail, but maybe once a month, I'd see. Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. So most of the time, you weren't sending things home. They were because you were bringing it back home with you. Yeah. yeah. People were getting packages from home, you know. Okay. Um, how often did you get any leave during your time to actually come home? There was, we got 30 days a year, take any time we wanted. Except for, you know, if you're, I see, you know, in a foreign country, you know, overseas. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just go on and leave overseas. Yeah. Once you're in port, you, you apply for it, and of course they work out schedules, make sure you can take it at that time. And <coughs> I see, okay. What, what did you do, you know, during those leave times? Did you come back to West Virginia? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I came home. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Is there any experiences that you had while you were on duty at night that you'd like to talk about? Well, I was messenger of the watch on a ship. You know, there was mm -hmm. three of us standing duty together. You had your officer of the deck and your uh, petty officer in charge and you messenger because I was an E3 mm -hmm. you know you had your messenger that watched well, yeah, I was just running errands so there's nothing there was one night on Roby Patrol and we were anchored out in the Philippines though um, that some Filipinos had climbed on board mm -hmm. you know they caught Banca boats out and it was kind of shocking to, to run on the Filipinos climbing on the ship yes and you're anchored off the coast 15 miles you know and you just like yell halt and they all take off running and jump off the ship you yeah. know uh huh that was a watch at night, but yeah, that was different. What do you think their intentions were? Were they trying to no steal way. things? or might have been trying to take brass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of brass on a ship. I remember when we were um, firing the forward gun um, in the Philippines, for, you know, just as an exercise, you know, practicing. Uh -huh. You know, eject these great big long cartridges, you know, want to stand this tall, you know, and mm -hmm. just boom, clang, 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 hit the deck. Well, the Bonka boats would just swarm up to the ship. They're trying to catch those hot son of a guns as they bounced off the ship. They take them back and make knives out of them. But you know, we you can't fire that gun with those people there because the percussion alone would knock them into a coma. Uh -huh. You know, but they would swarm up to the ship to catch those things. For the it's brass, correct? I don't know if they're but they were kind of a grayish metal. Uh -huh. You know, there was brass in the in the fire at the timer mechanism, the uh -huh. time mechanism, time fuse mechanism. Mm -hmm. But I mean they would make it, I know they used the things to make um, butterfly knife blades. Uh -huh. They would use them and I guess they could use that brass. As, you know, Just trying to sca them. scavenge anything. Do you, yeah, any, do you remember any other instances of them you know, scavenging even things that the military was throwing away? Oh yeah, that's off base all the time. There was a huge black market in the Longo Post City. Mm 
-hmm. You know, I mean, we were allowed to buy four quarts a month of liquor, mm -hmm. and if you get a gallon of Jack Daniels, man, you can make a fortune in the long black market by it. Mm -hmm. And I even saw one Filipino had a um, military IT card, and he wasn't in the military. And he could slip on base and get stuff. Hmm. Um, was alcohol something in the Philippines that was really regulated? I mean, for them or yeah. no? Yeah, you live. You leave the base. You cross a bridge over a sewage drainage. You know, it's a river. Mm -hmm. It's a sewage drainage for the city. It's called Shit River. Mm -hmm. In the daytime, there's boys, you know, throw a peso in the water, and they jump in the water and get the peso come out within their teeth. At night, there's girls in bonka boats, little nets, begging for pesos down there. You cross Shit River, you're in the town. You have Mag Side Drive, blocks and blocks and blocks, and it's first, second, third floor bars. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole drive, cost, it's bars and massage parlors and money exchanges. That's mm -hmm. pretty much all it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, you need a lot of trouble there. Um, do you have any comments on uh, when did you know how long you were going to be in the military? I was originally in for six years active, and um, I had a captain's mask before I got out of A school. Uh huh. So that uh, knocked two. It, it, my a school was knocked down by 10 weeks, but it knocked two years off my tour, my active duty. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we'll tell you what, we'll give you your E4 after you stay in school another 10 weeks and everything will be back to normal. And I was like, well, you know what? Let's just try the four years for now. I mean, that sounds better than six. So mm -hmm. I was in there four years active, two years reserve. Okay. Um, you'd mentioned that you were injured. Was that during your reserve time? That was at C actually. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, would you like to describe that at all? Um, it was, I told you it was the basic point defense. Mm -hmm. I was loading missiles and um, it wasn't actually out at sea. We'd been to sea, pulled into an ammunition port and mm -hmm. uh, the missiles come on board and they're in, in long containers, you know. Um, you take the top off and it's laying in there. Well, first thing you do is uh, put it up on wheels so you can move it around to where you want it. Mm -hmm. And um, you put the top fins on, you know, the guy, the front fins and the back fins, and uh, then you raise it up, it's going to the launch, and you put the bottom fins on before it goes all the way up and put it in the launcher. Mm -hmm. um, this thing, had somebody had let it go or whatever when the missile had its top fins on mm -hmm. and let it go and went across the deck, and the top fin came across my knees and pinned my knees to the launcher and broke one knee and um, screwed the other one up pretty bad too. Mm -hmm. And it just dropped me right there. I mean, I couldn't walk or anything. Mm -hmm. And it was somebody had, you know, just let it go and it took off rolling, crashed into me and mm -hmm. almost cut my legs off. Okay. Um, how did the um, recuperation with that go? I mean, was there a lot of... I spent a lot of time on crutches and canes after that, mm -hmm. you know? couple of years. My mm -hmm. military career was on crutches and canes. I mean, they, I even was I see on crutches. Mm -hmm. I'd go downtown Philippines and buy a cane, they'd, the shore patrol stop me, take it away, take me back to base. I had to have a piece of paper saying I was allowed to carry a cane, you know, because I said the Philippines is wild, you know, kill somebody with a cane. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, when did the injury, I mean, what year, around Ooh. what year? 75. 75. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you spent the last, probably the last year of active duty with the injury and then... Yeah, well, I, mean, I eventually came off the cane and crutches and everything, mm -hmm. but um, what's happened is it's, they called it traumatic arthritis at the time. Mm -hmm. Then it was called osteophytosis. Well, I know it's osteoarthritis now, just mm -hmm. got out of nursing school, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it's, tra it's traumatic osteoarthritis and it's degenerative. So it's probably improved at first, and then as as, your, as years went on, there's been... Mm -hmm. Well, they had a lot of uh, physical rehab, mm -hmm. you know, in Long Beach, California, and places like that, and yeah, it got me back on my feet pretty good, you know. But I always, ha always had a limp, because yeah. of the broken knee. Have yeah. you taken advantage of the VA services? 
that's who's putting me through school now. Yes. Um, I just spent the last four years in college on the Chapter 31 Vogue Rehab Program, uh -huh. which is probably the best program out there. And I feel very fortunate that I have that. Mm -hmm. you know, I spent the last three years in nursing school. So uh, you've had very good experiences with the, with the VA services. Then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've, and I've heard people complain about the VA hospital. I go to the one in Clarksburg and the one in Beckley. I've never had a complaint with them. They've always, you know. And I go to the uh, clinic now in Parsons. Mm -hmm. and I got an appointment there tomorrow for checkup. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, they've all been great to me. I mean, I can't see why anybody. Can, well, people like to complain. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, they're efficient. In my personal opinion, you know, it's take a number and boom, you're called and you go. This done, this done, this done. You know, you show up for your appointment on time. I've been, I should have done my appointments early, and uh, was finished before my son got his car out of the parking lot. Uh huh. You know, I'm calling us to get back up here. Uh huh. Okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to mention that you've you've done in your civilian life since your your military service? Um, what I have done. Well, anything maybe possibly related or to the military? Uh, yes, or, or possibly no. um, something you think may have you were prepared for during your military service, you know, later in life. A job. I went to electronic school back in the um, early 80s, uh -huh. and just from my experience in military and going to school there, I mean, I kind of have breezed through that school mm -hmm. because of the training I got in the military. Okay. You know, I, I actually I helped a lot of my other students in the class because who couldn't understand some things that I already knew how to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, um, did you work in a profession of, of with electronics or anything? Actually, um, I was my goal was to get a job at the observatory in uh, Green Bank uh -huh. and I could never get on there for some reason and uh, I ended up doing things like installing burglar alarms and phone systems and uh -huh. you know things like so that. So it's related? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, would you like to describe how it was uh, anything about returning home for good? I mean, was it something you looked forward to greatly or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I got out of the military in September, uh, active duty, on mm -hmm. uh, so September 8, 77. And my vacation pay that I had saved up, and my uh, departure pay, or whatever they call it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had about $1,600 in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Well, I started hitchhiking. And I hitchhiked to Atlanta, California, see my brother. He was in the Air Force, at George Air Force Base. Uh -huh. <coughs> Stayed with him a few days. And I hitchhiked. My mom said, oh, you got to go see this cousin. Uh, I hitchhiked up to Los Olivos, California. Uh -huh. And uh, my cousin, I had never met in my life, um, just retired as vice president of Arco Oil Company. Had a huge wine ranch and raised prize horses. And So I stayed there for a few days. And then I went to San Fr hitchhiked to San Francisco. Almost got mugged there, so I caught a bus to Reading and then hitchhiked to Portland. And um, a friend of mine um, was just gotten out of the military, was in Portland, so I stayed with his, him and his parents for three or four days. Uh -huh. Then I hitchhiked to uh, Seattle and uh, stayed with a couple of Navy buddies there in Seattle. And of course, they found other ones and they came. Then I hitchhiked to uh, Spokane, Washington. and. Uh, my friend had gone to see, he was my roommate in San Diego, so I knew his father, and he was from Spokane. Mm -hmm. So I found his father there and stayed with him a night, and he said, well, his mother wants to meet you. So I went over to his mother. I didn't even know he had two little brothers. Well, mm -hmm. I went to my mother's house, and the little brothers took me downtown, showed me the old World's Fair, you know, showed me around the city, and I went home. She wouldn't let me leave, so I didn't get to go see his dad again, but I stayed with them three or four days. Then I hitchhiked to Moscow, Idaho, another Navy buddy's house. Mm -hmm. Stayed there about three or four days. Of course, he found two other Navy buddies up in that area. Uh, Norman Ship, which I still keep in contact with all these people, by uh -huh. the way. Um, and uh, Cedric Weber, an old postal clerk, was on our ship. Then I hitchhiked to uh, Great Falls, Montana, and caught a bus to Haver. And had a friend in Haver, and that was party time up there. I, was, I had to make an escape. Caught the bus back to Great Falls, hitchhiked to, uh, well, this is the longest stretch of hitchhiking I ever did in my life was uh -huh. uh, from um, Great Falls, Montana to uh, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, um, Moorhead, Minnesota area. Mm -hmm. Had a friend in Moorhead, stayed with 
ran to a con man. He's trying to adopt me, showing me how to, you know, con Jewish rabbis and people out of money to, you know. Uh -huh. uh, went to my visit my buddy in Moorhead, Minnesota. Stayed there for a while, and then uh, hitchhiked to a friend of mine outside of Chicago. Stayed with him for a while. Hitchhiked to a friend of mine's house in Cleveland. Stayed there for a while. And, um, caught a bus or somewhere around there because I got tired of hitchhiking. It was getting cold out. Mm -hmm. And caught to Charleston, West Virginia. Called my mother. She cussed me out because she didn't know where I was for last month and a half. Uh -huh. Yeah, I couldn't even get insurance because I didn't have a dead body. Uh -huh. and, um, I uh, caught the bus to White Sulphur Springs and she came and got me. Uh -huh. So I, when I got out of the military, I, I hitchhiked around the United States. Uh -huh. Went from San Diego to Seattle to West Virginia. That was a pretty good experience for yeah, you. Yeah, when I got home, I had $50 left. But uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I was, not, I was fearless. Uh huh. You know. Okay, all right. Um, well, I would. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? at all. Yeah, uh, actually just recently, I mean, I started digging up people on the internet mm -hmm. around 1999 when I, 1998 or 99 when I discovered the internet. Mm -hmm. I was working front desk um, at a hotel or at Snowshoe uh -huh. on midnight shift and here, here's the internet, see what you can do. I started finding people, like I would type in a name in this state, I find 27 results. Uh -huh. Well, I had a copy machine there and envelopes there and everything, so I just write a letter, copy it. And you know, I, got, I, wanted, I was looking for Frank Medina in Colorado. So uh -huh. I find all the Frank Medinas, and I write him a letter. Are you this person? I mail all 27 letters. I get a response. I found somebody. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I did this and and uh, started finding emails to people, and I started emailing them. And this well, kind of got bigger and bigger. And in 2001, and within two years, we had our first reunion in Mobile, Alabama. Uh -huh. uh, Sergeant Ross Franklin Gray was a Medal of Honor winner, uh -huh. and uh, from uh, and got his injuries and died in Iwo Jima and um, we had our he was from Alabama so our first reunion was in Mobile Alabama in 2001 and not only were his descendants there the Gray family uh -huh. but two of the fellows he fought with in World War II were there uh -huh. and they could tell what about us about him yes and we've had five reunions since next one's gonna be in Las Vegas uh -huh. And uh, there we have a Facebook page now, and it's just taken off like wildfire. People uh -huh. making comments on it and bringing back reminiscences and uh -huh. talking about old sea stories and this, that, and that. So it's kind of exciting because we just got um, the reunion, and it was in St. Louis. And people... Is the Facebook page, is, I mean, is it just USS Gray? It's USS Gray, D-E, slash F-F, 1054, um... Crew members, two words for some reason. Okay. And David Libby monitors it, and you got to apply it and have him approve it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and uh, always people are getting on there and talking about old sea stories. You post photographs and things. They all pictures from back then uh -huh. and things. You know, it's just it just blows my mind. It even has the ship going uh, when it was first went into mothballs. Mm -hmm. and then as it was had a whole number was scraped off, going to scrap. You know, and I think it was. Uh, Went to scrap like 2001, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, pictures from back in the day, the people on the ships, and pictures of along the coast of the Philippines, you know, uh -huh. and things like that. It's it's been a really wild ride, and I don't know if any other ship or whatever feels that camaraderie or has stayed in contact or as tight as we have over the years. Mm -hmm. but we sure have, mm -hmm. and um, you know, there was a, there's a great camaraderie in the military that you don't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize it while you're there until it's gone. Mm -hmm. And of course, you get out of the military, and of course, it just eventually fades away. You know, you just can't walk into a room and everybody be family anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not used to having pets around, you know, or kids, or you know, cause yeah. you're used to being in the adult male world. Um, but um, you know, now you eventually just back. You go there's your reunions, and of course, everybody they're their family is your family now too. I mean, it's not just them. Their mm -hmm. wife is your wife, you know, your sister. Mm -hmm. You know, they're part of the family, and you don't realize it that you become so close until it's time to go, and you realize you don't want to leave them again this time. Mm -hmm. You know, you left them once. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, and but it, it hits you back. You don't realize it until you go to a reunion, and, and then of course you know you got to promise yourself you're going to make it to the next one. Yeah. And yeah. uh, of course, they're getting bigger and more people are showing. People didn't make it to the first three, made it to the last two, and yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's something else. 
Okay, great. Um, do you have any advice you might want to give to uh, individuals thinking about joining the military or um, individuals possibly in the military right now? Okay, yeah, if you're going to join the military, be, beware of that square needle in the left nut and boot camp. <laughs> No, I was told that before I went in. I was scared to death, and I got there and heard the rumor. Uh -huh. But yeah, um, <laughs> no, um, yeah. Piece of advice was given me by an old um, drill sergeant himself where I went in. Said in boot camp, um, said, uh, "Do what you're told, and don't do any more, uh -huh. and don't volunteer for anything." Uh -huh. Said, "Don't do any more or less than what you're asked to do, and don't volunteer." And I tell you what, I, I was a squad leader, and I followed those words. I remembered them. And it sure got me through boot camp because I saw everybody else thought they were going to do more than they were supposed to or do less. And I saw what happened to them. Uh -huh. Or if they volunteered, I need to volunteer. You stick your hand up. Okay, get there, shovel that pile of shit there for the next nine days, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I followed those words and it carried me through my, yeah. You know, don't do any more or any less. Just do what you're told. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for taking time to do this interview, and I'd also like to especially thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. Certainly.